this writing workshop series is brought to you by the Center for Sacred Sciences in Eugene, Oregon. The Center's mission is to teach the core truth shared by all the world's great mystics, to foster a new worldview based on that truth, and to support a community of practitioners who wish to discover that truth in their own experience. You can visit centerforsacredsciences.org for hundreds of audios, videos, and articles, as well as a calendar of events. And now, Episode 1 of 4 of the Go As Nothing Writing Workshop Series with Mary Song. Greetings, everyone. I'm Mary Song, and this is the four-part Go As Nothing Writing Workshop. I wanted to let you know that the point of our method is to illuminate the story of I through creative writing. The story of I is an expression you may not have heard before, but in this workshop that will begin to unfold. Now, in realizing the fictional nature of the narrative streaming through our mind like a daily soap opera, I bet you've noticed that from time to time. We have a greater chance to loosen our grip on our obsessive attention to that narrative. The power of the narrative is that it's so convincing to us, we tend to believe everything it shows us and tells us. But when we recognize the story as a product of imagination, we realize we no longer have to believe in it or be enslaved by it. When we see through our personal soap opera, the filter through which we experience life as separate beings may begin to dissipate, and then we have a chance to know the true nature of being. So I want to tell you that the Go is Nothing writing workshops are designed to focus on unfolding the imagination intuitively. And although personal stories are likely to come up, we do not dwell on these stories. And often I will ask the participants to write pure fiction. I happen to love fiction, and I see fiction everywhere I look. The writing workshops are not therapy groups. I always like to make that clear. Although therapy may spontaneously happen for a participant. And the workshops are not about becoming better writers, although I have found that making a commitment to write every day often leads to better writing. So the Go Is Nothing uh, writing workshops are about awakening. And the name Go Is Nothing is based on a spiritual teaching given to me by the modern mystic Joel Morwood of the Center for Sacred Sciences based in Eugene, Oregon. This teaching allowed me to drop my story long enough to see clearly a situation that I thought was going to be very stressful. So stressful that I went to my teacher to ask for advice. And it turned out to be stress-free because of the Go Is Nothing teaching. And this teaching will unfold throughout our four episodes. So please join us for our first episode. I'm so glad you're here. And then continue with the series because each will dovetail into the next. In a moment on the screen, you will see our first writing prompt, which the participants have already received. Now take 10 minutes, if you will, and try it for yourself. And we'll also have in-session writings. So you might want to keep that pen and paper handy. Welcome. So glad you're here. Welcome to a unique experience. And here is your first writing prompt with instructions. Come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of leaving, it doesn't matter. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come, even if you have broken your vow a hundred times, as Rumi says, come, come yet again. 
So greetings to all and welcome to everyone who is tuning into the first episode of the Go As Nothing Writing Workshop. This is the first in a series of four episodes that will all link together. And we have the same participants you see here in each episode. And I hope that if you're tuning in with us that you're going to be trying out these prompts yourself and just see how this might unfold for you as we go along. So you have already received the first prompt if you're tuning in with us and maybe you have written it and, and will be listening to us do it as well. Um, and to get started, I'd like to jump into introductions. Now, I love to do um, really off the wall uh, introductions, often with fiction, making up new names and such. But this time, because it's our first episode, I want to start with what we actually like to be called and introduce ourselves to the listening audience who knows who you are. Um, and we'll go around the room in our order of names, which begins with first myself, and then we go Deborah, Wayne, Shani, Hartsong, Robin, Jed, Nirja, and Aaron. And so what I'd like everyone to do is tell us the name. I just said your name, but tell us again what you like to be called. And then what is your experience with this writing practice? Some of you have been with me from the beginning and some have never done this before, which I think is great to have on a recorded series such as this. So I'd like to start with myself then. I'm Mary Song. I'm a teacher at the Center for Sacred Sciences in Eugene, Oregon. And about three to four years ago, I began to develop this method of using creative writing for spiritual illumination. So I have taught creative writing for many years and other types of writing. And now, as a teacher for the center, I wanted to bring, uh, uh, bring this idea in and see how it would develop. So workshops I've held in person at the center building in Eugene and on Zoom have brought us to this moment in time of bringing the writing practice to the public. So it's new for us to try this. We've always had intimate small group uh, together, confidentiality, everything stays in a group. But now we're trying something new and I'm delighted to welcome this group of eight plus myself and all of you who might be tuning in. So welcome, welcome, and we'll go next to our friend, it's Deborah. Hi. What can you tell us? I'm Deborah. Um, I have done several of these workshops with Mary Song over the past about four years, the first couple in person and then the rest on Zoom, which works really well. And I have found it to be extremely helpful and it engenders some really powerful um, feelings and changes in me. Um, so mm. I'm looking forward. I haven't been writing for a little while, so I'm looking forward to this jump-starting my writing practice a little bit. So good to have you with us, Deborah. Thank you for doing this. Okay, and next up. My name is Wayne, and uh, this will be my first experience with the Go Is Nothing writing workshop. Um, my experience in writing is primarily in songwriting, a uh, uh, sort of contemporary singer-songwriter style music. So Wonderful. I'm looking forward to the sessions. And I'm so happy to have a newcomer. We have one other one we'll get to, but thank you, Wayne, for being here. And next up. Hi, everyone. My name is Shani, and I have been with Mary Song almost since the beginning of these. I think I maybe missed the first one. Um, I'll just jump to the chase. It is always enlightening to me. It's always a deep reflection, uh, a new revelation, and sometimes just remembering really deeply the truth. And I, it always seems to come at just the right time. Mm. So nice. I'm very happy to be here and just very grateful, very deeply humbled to be part of this. Shani, thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. My name's Hartsong, 
And uh, I've done this a few times and it's always been uh, very illuminating. And I actually am surprised at the writing that comes out of me because I don't consider myself a writer, but when I read some of my pieces to other people, they do. So <laughs> it's an interesting, it's an interesting experience. And I, I learn and I just, I'm so appreciative of the opportunity to be part of a group to write. It's a wonderful experience. So thank, thank you, Mary you. Song. Thank you, Hard Song. So beautiful to have you here. And hi, everyone. My name is Robin, and I've been doing several rounds of these as well. And um, ditto so much of what the other participants have said. But um, I was thinking it's kind of like me and yoga. Like I can't really do yoga at home by myself. I need to go to a class to really get out and enjoy it. And um, the writing is the same. There's something about the group element that really drives it for me that I love hearing other people's readings. I love to share my own readings and uh, it's just such a wonderful give and take. So that's my favorite thing about this process. Beautiful. Thank you, Robin. Great to have you here. I'm Jed. I've always just gone by Jed. And I first started doing the uh, writing groups uh, about four years ago as well. And I was just thinking, I don't remember what motivated me to first start. I think it was just because I was uh, going to the center and I just wanted to get to know the people at the center more and uh, just meet other like-minded people and here we are <laughs> <laughs> thank you jed i'm happy to have you here hello everybody my name is nirja and i have participated in quite a few workshops with mary song and have always found them to be really powerful and insightful and i'm thrilled to be here with this group of people thank you nirja thank you Good to have you. I am Aaron, and this is my first experience with the writing workshop as well. I'm actually like Wayne, I used to write songs in college, actually. I'm more of a classical guitarist now, but I'm really excited to dive in. And I, I know the support of many members of, of this group, and I'm really excited and open to discovering something new. Wonderful. Thank you, Aaron. Good to have you here. And I think that's everyone. So I hope that our, our listening audience will feel um, invited into our group here. Know that we're aware of you and we welcome you into this. So let's get started. Our first prompt, which our listening audience has already received as well, and maybe have written. I will read it to you. My inner movie theater holds me captive with. Okay, that's the prompt. Everyone's written it already. And I prefaced it by saying, suppose the story of I is a continuous stream of images, creating a narrative, many narratives over and over, going on and on. Now, jump into the prompt no thinking allowed don't you know think and calculate and draw it out on a board just write we're trying to bypass the thinking mind go directly into intuition and that creative flow and let something uh, be shown to us as we go so we will begin with a round of readings and each person will read in the order of names that i've given and after someone reads we bow to the person, all of us together. We pause a couple of seconds, you know. No, we're not going to comment on each other. And then the next person starts automatically. We bow the next person, and we'll go through the whole uh, group of eight that way. At the end, we may have some commentary. If you wanted to say something, uh, let's hold any comments to the end of that. Sound good? Okay. You know, I really wanted to call this prompt help by being held captive in a movie theater, but I thought, no, too gimmicky. Let's, let's make it more streamlined. My inner movie theater holds me captive with, and I am going to mute microphone and let Deborah take it away. 
My inner movie theater holds me captive with a continuous stream of images, rehearsals of conversations I've had or would like to have. Let me give you a piece of my mind, but will never have. Repeating over and over a word or a phrase I find interesting, colors, numbers, fantasies, fears. It begins when I wake up, or maybe it doesn't ever stop. I seldom remember my dreams. It never ends. Never, never, never. I hear some people have quiet in their heads. I don't understand how that, that works. I have been noticing lately that I am exhausted. Not tired, not fatigued, exhausted. It's not something that can be rectified with a nap or a good night's sleep, neither of which occur often, not without help. It's deeper than deep, in my bones, as they say, but deeper yet, in my cells, in my cytoplasm even. My exhaustion is inseparable from me. As far as I know, it is me. And it began a long time ago. Not last month, not last year. It began at my birth. Perhaps before. I have been exhausted for 63 years at least. I am tired of being exhausted, which is not redundant, as I said. The other day, I had a meltdown. Not unusual. I was distraught and inconsolable. What was unusual was that I saw, for the first time, in 63 fucking years, what was happening and why. I melted down from burnout. Now I have a term for it. It is called autistic burnout. It is a thing. I need to rest. I need to stop the merry-go-round of pretending to be someone I'm not, first to myself and then to all the others, because it's this, the incessant strain since birth of playing a role, of being who I think others need me to be, of hiding how my brain actually works. I am afraid of what and who I will find and who others will see when I drop the mask, but I am too exhausted to keep wearing it. My inner movie theater holds me captive with its dazzling display of emotional episodes, intellectual curiosities, juxtapositions of colored patterns and images alternating light and dark, and oh, the stories that are projected on its little screen. How small must the screen be to set up in an insignificantly sized cranium? Yet the micro-sized tragedies and victories, soap opera dramas, Contrived talk shows, complete story and one-hour sporting events continue to pull at my attention, keeping me in my loge seat for long periods of time, leaving only for sustenance and sudden emergencies. Following such respites from the theater, I realize that I have a chance to abandon my captivation by it, but without exception thus far, I fork out the dollar fifty. Wait, it's now eight bucks to re-enter. It's also always the case that my seat, the one in the center of row four, not too close, not too far back, is available. I find it curious as well that there don't seem to be any other moviegoers. It's a surprise because this set of films making up the story of I is really blockbuster material. But as songwriter David Wilcox crooned, what is it really that's keeping me from living a life that's true? There are many times that I recognize that I could be doing something else, possibly more fruitful, more authentic, more loving, more creative, more expanding, more true, rather than just sitting here with my buttered popcorn. My inner movie theater holds me captive with impatience, spectacular impatience that binds, clinches, wanting something now and more. But why? There's no getting there. 
this hurry, oh, to stop, pause, collect, reflect, fully open this lily angel at my table, returning me home, like a balloon deflating, a storm passing, water being sucked down a drain, everlasting peace and patience that always is, that always loves, revealing again, again, captive gone, until another spurt-ing crawls or smashes through the cracks of storytelling, the timeless ancient art. My inner movie theater holds me captive with all the drama of who I am, what I can accept in my life, what I should be doing, if I'm doing enough, am I being too solitary? And it goes on and on until I say stop and breathe and look out at the physical world that surrounds me. But then it will begin again. Who am I? What am I? How do I fit into this world I see? Stop, breathe, breathe again. Look out at the trees, the sky, feel my feet stepping, my body alive, and again. What are you going to get done today? What needs to be done? And I stop, relax into my body, and remind myself that this moment is all there is, and I am what I am, and I'm okay, and the rest is mind play. Stories about what I think I am, what I should be doing to be more productive, I don't think I spend much time judging others, but I do a great job judging myself. All that negativity, opinion that seems so real in the moment of thinking and useless in the moment of what is. I slow my steps, breathe deeply again, appreciate that I am and that my surroundings are. Acknowledge that I'm part of it all and all is part of me, one whole, including the inner movie theater. My inner movie theater holds me captive with images I can't ignore or forget. The latest song I've heard repeating itself as my personal radio throughout the day. God, I wish it would stop so I could focus more at the dull work in front of me. It's distracting. The movie tells me who I am in relation to others, a daughter to my parents, for example. It is so thorough, it even tells me what kind of daughter I am. A good daughter if I call regularly, and a bad daughter if I don't. A good daughter if I listen, and a bad daughter if I'm disappointed because I wanted them to ask how I was doing and they didn't. At work in my personal movie, I'm a good guy, helping out when needed and being easy to get along with until I speak up when in a position of being in charge of the nurse who is being lazy. And then I'm the evil disciplinarian. On the road, I am a good driver until I accidentally cut too close in front of the person in the next lane while simply trying to get over to my exit in time. And then I am the bad driver who gets honked at. The movie goes on and on. And when I am in the context of no one, there's plenty of time for reruns to reinforce the story and then try to figure out if I am the villain or the heroine. Is it ever possible to be neither? Is it possible to somehow not mind one or the other? Or is it just what the mind does? It seems as banal as the ridiculous math problems we were expected to solve in school, estimating the time one car would need to overtake another, as if one would actually ever really need to calculate such a thing in real time. In my real time episode, there's always something going on. My inner movie theater holds me captive with opportunity. My awareness is of the experience, my focus more from the screen to my seat. 
There are others here. We share much and create distinction with varying perspective. Here, there, I, us, they, all held within this theater. The narrative being shown on the screen in contrast with the one occurring to me variously as my focus and attention shifts. The screen holding my thoughts, coloring my sensations until a leg goes tingly, a cough is heard, a baby yelps, someone shuffles past. The image on the screen is a loop playing called Samsara. No one remembers how they came to be in this theater, yet here we all are together, focusing as long as we seem able to on the screen, but the loop becomes obvious and predictable. Eventually, the focus can't help but shift. Some grow uncomfortable with the projection and begin to seek comfort get more snacks, use the restroom, but once back in the seat, Samsara begins telling its story all over again. What is there to do about any of it? Being is already accomplished. Here we are. Dissatisfaction and desire for something else never change what is projected on the screen. Over and over, the loop repeats. In time, the people in the theater change. Some leave for milk duds and never return, while the baby that yelped becomes a toddler kicking the back of the chair in front of him. My inner movie theater gives all I perceive, and the opportunity I have is not to believe the projection, but something wholly other. Any question that arises, any answers given, here we are. My inner movie theater holds me captive with stories of my youth. I love the scenes of my early childhood, like when I was two and living with grandma. We would sit on the front porch of her apartment building and I was the darling of all our friends until I lifted the skirt of my dress and was not wearing underwear. Do I really remember this or just the story? Either way, I have a clear image of little me in my frilly dress with pin curled hair. I also have a movie of grandma at her funeral. I am now 19 and it is my first funeral of someone I loved. I see myself looking into her coffin and not recognizing her. How could that be grandma? Others said how good she looked, 20 years younger. Ah before I knew her. Another movie I've watched many times is of when my mom died. She was in the hospital with pneumonia. I held her hand and she looked at me with pleading eyes. I see them still, but I don't know what she was pleading for, to live or to die. I thought for years that she was pleading for help, help to live but I really don't know. Such different stories arise depending on what she was asking. Was my mom afraid to die or begging to die? Or perhaps she wasn't pleading at all, just saying goodbye. My inner theater holds me captive with something private, inner, and fearful. I'm alone here. It's my world. I'm victim to it, and it devours me. I can't lend it anything, nor will it wait for me to make a move, a call, a judgment, a roll of the dice. The characters all know their parts too well. And though it is my life, they know me well, too. So well, there's not even any reason to interact, to share, to communicate. I am, and they know it. And I know that they know it.
so why bother? The flashing lights, loud colors, it's addictive. There's nothing sane about it, but I sit and watch. I don't know how much popcorn I've in, I'm ingesting. I'm glued and can't get unstuck. Nobody tells me the seat next to me is empty. The ceiling tile is missing a corner. It evades me like the setting sun. My inner theater holds me captive because it has to. The mystery is juicy, explicit, raw, and voracious. The inner theater are all my children. And what do I have to do to satiate them? They are lost, frustrated, angry, and afraid. I alone can stop and give them water and a hand to hold. It's not fair. I can't believe he left me. She isn't even that smart. They fight amongst themselves. The screen isn't even a screen, it's a house. I'm not an idle listener observer, I'm the caretaker, the butler, the boyfriend, and the grandmother. But who is it that takes care of me? This is what the screen devours, not out of lack of goodness, out of lack of fearlessness. My hands grip the wheel ever tighter because without my tired hands, the bus goes down, I go down. And what happens when I have let everybody go down? What happens when I have no one to care for, to fix, to look after? Wouldn't I be like the night sky, unable to see my own face in the mirror, like the moon over a bed of water? Whew. I don't know about you all, but um, I always feel such joy <laughs> at this kind of tapestry that we weave here. I mean, we have all eight voices, um, and somehow it all comes to me as one voice, like one beautiful tapestry of poems um, or expression, life expressing itself. Does anyone have a comment that you, you would like to say something about what you just heard, either an in individual piece or the experience of hearing it all together? Anybody have something? Yeah, go ahead, Jed. I was really touched by what you wrote, Deborah. It was, uh, I really felt like I could feel what you were expressing. And the way you expressed yourself was... Uh, made me feel like I'm not the only one that feels that way sometimes. And so I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I will also say that I was surprised to see some similarity in several of the writings. So <laughs> yes, we are not alone. That's an amazing part of it. We can hear ourselves and others writing. I mean, it begins to, um, uh, dissolve the separation. I mean, we see ourselves in these little boxes here. We look separate, and yet somehow it's all one screen, <laughs> which is quite profound, spiritually speaking. So voices are this way too, um, and our expressions, our creative expressions. Anyone else want to speak up? Okay. One of the methods I like to use in this practice is to mix up the point of view as well as verb tense, uh, but I want to just focus on point of view uh, for a moment. And for some folks listening in, you, you may not have really stopped to think about, you know, different points of view. So let me just run through the basics very quickly. The first person, I, don't we just love it? We cling to it. I, I think this, <laughs> I own this, I want this. Um, but that first person, I, uh, we identify with. I woke up this morning, I made myself a cup of tea. Just then my phone rang. So that's all in the first person. And we can tell what we call true stories, lived experience, and we can make up fiction with that first person I, which is, is um, I recommend trying that. 
but let me talk about the second person because for some never have heard what's a second person the second person is you i happen to love the second person i love to write in the second person you woke up this morning i'm talking about myself when i say you you <laughs> not you okay you can do that you know talk about someone else but i'm like bringing this back into ourselves you woke up this morning you made yourself a cup of tea just then your phone rang okay same story but the point of view has shifted and then finally the third person there could be a fourth and a fifth maybe but we'll stick with these three the third person she he they okay I'll use she in this case. She woke up this morning. She made herself a cup of tea. Just then her phone rang. You know, when I teach creative writing classes and a student might be having a writer's block, they just, there's something they want to write. They just can't get, they just can't bear it. can't get into the eye. I said, let's try the third person. And away they go and they write something. Wow, they surprise themselves. By getting a little distance, getting that eye out of the way, okay, and trying it. So uh, we're going to do a little experiment uh, with that. But first of all, we're going to write in the first person I, which you all have done so far. We're going to do it again. We're going to do a free writing. Free. Writing that's free. What that means is free of thinking. So no thinking allowed. And some will say, I can't write if I can't really think it over for, I need 20 minutes, Mary, song. <laughs> but in this case, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm the taskmaster here. Free writing means the pen hits the page or the fingers hit the keys. And away you go. You don't stop and think. You don't scratch out. You don't change words. You don't wonder, Did I, am I doing this right? <laughs> doesn't matter if you do it. There is no wrong and right. You cannot fail. Whatever you write is meant to be written at this time. So don't think it over. Trust your creative flow. It won't let you down. So viewers uh, listening in here, uh, give this a try right now. We're going to do it in real time. Everybody needs something to write with, to write on or the fingers on the keys in front of you that you can access easily. And I will give um, three to four minutes only. Sometimes I'm, I'm at the three minute mark and I say just a little bit longer and we go a little longer. Um, so I'll call it when it's done. I'll say, let's, let's finish that last sentence and boom, we're done. So, if I interrupt you, because I sometimes do this, um, I like to teach by intuition. And sometimes it occurs to me, do that, do that. And then I do it and then some magic happens. So you may be riding along and all of a sudden I'll say something. And what I mean is finish the line you were just on and now start again with this line. Okay. Sometimes I do it uh, three times or I don't know. We'll just see. Okay, everybody ready? I'll give you the lead in and you write the lead in on the paper and then you just go and write it across. All right. And then I'll say, I'll let you know when we're done. Okay. The prompt is, I tell myself a story about
I tell myself a story about And we're on the last line, so go ahead and start bringing that to a close. A few seconds more. And coming to a stop when you get that last word out. Okay, <laughs> shake out that hand. <laughs> How's that feel? Good? Wayne says no. <laughs> well, let's try this. Let's try this. You take what you have, everybody at home listening in, everybody here, take what you have now, which has been written in the first person. I want you to go through and change all your pronouns to the third person. So, I would use she, you might use they or he, all right? And then you would change, like I would change um, myself to herself and mine to hers. So you have to change those lines. I'll just give you a minute to go through what you've written, scratch out the I, and put in the third person. We can also do this with second person, which is so powerful. But I want to do a demonstration here on the third person. And for those at home, if you feel some confusion, confusion can be, you know, an energy that leads to something new. <laughs> So let's see how, how this works out for you. Changing the eyes, the first person to the third. Yeah, Wayne, go ahead. Okay, I'm going to third person from I to he, for example. Yes. Uh -huh. And uh, am I changing the verb? Uh, yeah, and the verbs. Thank you for pointing that out. Because the verb changes here. I tell myself a story about becomes he tells himself a story about. So yeah, the verb change. Yeah, I forgot to, to mention that. Mary Song. Yes. In the first person I referred to somewhere as here, mm -hmm. would it be appropriate to refer to it in the third person as there? It depends, I think, on the context. Does here also work in that case, or he finds it himself could. here? Or I'll think about it. Yeah, don't think, don't think. <laughs> <laughs> don't think about it too much. 
you, you can certainly change it to there, but sometimes um, here would also work. And when you get through that one time, just, you know, give me a nod. Let me know you're all ready. Good. Nurse is ready. Deborah's ready. Robin, Shannon, Aaron's ready. Heart Song's ready. Wayne, you there yet? Or you're out there in space floating around. <laughs> Where am I? Jed, y'all ready? Okay, so Wayne, you go ahead and take another minute and uh, um, and we'll tune in just a minute. And we're going to have a round of readings. Uh, you're going to hear this in yourselves. You're going to hear it in the third person. Something you wrote in the first will now be pronounced <laughs> to yourself and to the world in the third. And so we're just looking to see what happens. Does that change it at all for you? Does it become spacious? Oh, spaciousness is great. Wayne, you're all ready or? Okay, just, you know, doesn't have to be perfect. You might say, oh, I forgot to change that verb. Don't worry, that's fine, okay? So we'll start with Deborah and go around our room and uh, we'll we'll just go one to the other, okay? With a little bow in between, no comments. All right, go ahead. She tells herself a story about when she was born. That is the first chapter, but is it? There were chapters before that. Does she think she needs to be present to be a character in all the chapters? There is the back story, and there is the now story, and there is the forward story. There isn't a beginning nor an end. It is a circle. No, it is a spiral, coming round to where it left off, but not quite. She tells herself a story about all of the things that went wrong. If only someone else could see these things, the things that tripped her up, that kept her from being what they call a success. She is angry about these things. She tells herself a story about all those ways she was wronged. Mother controlled what she ate. Father told her she couldn't make enough money being a linguist. They told her she was too sensitive and maybe lazy too and selfish. Or did she tell these things to herself, but heard it in their voices like a ventriloquist? He tells himself a story about the other guy. Why is he so successful? Why can't he be different? Why can't he be like him? Of course, this reliance on gender is a bit confusing. He could easily replace he with she or some other useful pronoun, but he digresses. He tells himself a story about the grass being covered by a layer of snow. He didn't realize that following the first full snowy winter of his life, the grass was still alive down there. He tells himself a story about his fingers on the keyboard. They are such talented little creatures. Is it possible that they could tell a story by themselves, independent of any mind? She tells herself a story about her thoughts, her actions, her feelings, voices, family, stories, stories about, you know, everything. And now the mechanism stops. Stories can just be silent. But, oh, she tells herself a story about her aging, her body, her hair how her fingers no longer work as they used to, until, thank goodness, remembering happens. And death is here. She tells herself a story about how she will miss her furry friend Pooja, for he too is aging. The story about death is a savior as time disappears. Go now, stories beyond her, free.
She tells herself a story about the time her grandmother rang a little bell to summon her servant, a black woman, to bring more water for the dinner table or to remove the plates. And this story angers her with its wrongness. She tells herself a story about her dog, Sandy, and the times she hid under the table, bribing him with dog treats, milk bones, that they ate together, her friend and herself. She tells herself a story about growing old with no encouraging outcome and then changes it so that she can embrace the outcome, scary as it might be. She has no answers here. The story can go on and on. She tells herself a story about the life she is living, about who she is. As she goes through her day, she tries to decide what the real story is. The less she tells stories, the more neutral she comes to feel. It seems sometimes there is an option. One option is not to tell a story, but usually it slips out too fast. She tells herself a story about what they were thinking, why they said that or did this. But then the option sometimes appears again. That's a story, it says, drop it. And the story falls away. She tells herself a story about the stories she is telling as if she could do anything about them. The story mill keeps churning either way. They will never stop. Wouldn't that be boring? The stories seem to keep her entertained. Whether or not she believes them is another thing. They tell themselves a story about their being. It compels them into action. Without it, they sit and wait, not knowing. All knowing and all doing is reaction to this story they tell themselves. It is the wind in the sails of a ship of awareness that sends their beginning to their destination. The death of this is the result of that. They tell themselves a story about what is happening, what they are doing, why it matters, what is wrong, and how to make it better. But as long as the story persists, their struggle to move forward continues. They tell themselves a story about getting it right, seeing no problem to fix, no problem to solve. What does that island look like? How would they know when they find it? She tells herself a story about how she's not good enough. This is an old familiar story that she's heard many times in many situations. She's not good enough. She'll never succeed. She can't do it. And then she realizes that this story is really pointing to the fact that she did not do it. She tells herself a story about how she's already lived her best life. No creativity left as though she had an infinite amount. She tells herself she's done creating art, that she never again will show her work or have it accepted or win prizes. She tells herself to stop listening to those useless stories that only want to show her as a loser. Why not tell stories about winning? Or better yet, not tell stories at all, just make art. He tells himself a story about love, all of the love, and shame, all of the shame. He can't do it all. He's never been able to do it all. All is too much. It defeats him every time. He won't let himself off the hook, not even once, and not even for letting himself off the hook.
It's a story of unlovability, impossibility, reaching for the stars on a trampoline. He tells himself a story about his own spiritual progress. He's good, he's bad. He's going this way and that, as if he knows, as if he's in control. Here, a plate of cookies. Smells good, huh? Now, where the hell did that come from? Can he let himself receive? He tells himself a story about a cage and a prisoner, restless, eager to escape. But to where? He just wants to get out. Is there a wild, wide open field somewhere? A Baskin Robbins? A parade? Can he be at home in this jail cell? What is really so wrong there? Is there any outside at all? I wish by some magic that the listening audience now could read their piece to us. Uh, wouldn't that be wonderful? I hope that if you are listening in, you will read your piece to yourself and hear it with your ears. Does anyone have a comment about how this shifted uh, when you went from the first to the third? Did anybody notice anything? Deborah, go ahead. I felt relief <laughs> <laughs> to have a little bit of distance. I guess, yeah. really, if I'm going to be honest, I felt like I was whining less. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and we have certain attachments and belief about that I, that first person I. But you know, fiction writers, they, they love to inhabit a third person point of view. And uh, we're doing that here. We're inhabiting that. Um, there's some magic going on there. Someone else want to speak up what you noticed about this shifting points of view? Yeah, uh, Nirja. Well, just in reading from the third person, it really makes me except that I'm not the only one who feels this. I'm not, the, yeah. I'm not the only storyteller. I mean, we all have similar stories at different times. And so it really points that out. Yeah, it's possible that the minute we say I, we're putting up some boundaries, that, you know, I, I'm this. But, you know, if we open up and begin to see the collective voice or hear the collective voice and feel the experience of being alive as not this little nutshell that we suffer inside. I mean, you know, this can unfold and it's going to continue unfolding um, in our four sessions. Anybody else want to speak up? Yeah, Aaron. Yeah, I, so I think there's two different things when I'm uh, reading it, what I've written and just to myself, mm -hmm. not out loud, there's a, there's definitely a sense of, of relief and like a little bit of distance and uh, I'm curious, actually, there's a lot of curiosity in there, which instead of the sort of, um, you know, maybe a little bit of shame when I, when it's about me and if there's something wrong with it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it's, get... pos it's possible you may feel some compassion for he that yeah. you didn't feel for I. I mean, it's, it's, you know, kind of silly in a way, just change that perspective so slightly. Oh, she felt so bad, you know, oh, I felt so bad. Well, you know, <laughs> see what I'm saying? Go ahead with your second point. Yeah, I mean, um, I think I'm just also reading it out loud, having a little bit of uh, performance anxiety mm -hmm. doing yeah. the music. So, so it was, it was, I couldn't really experience almost the moment happening when I was reading it out loud then, but, but certainly myself, it, it shifted. I understand what you're saying. And, you know, you had awareness to that. So instead of just being overwhelmed, I can't take it or whatever, you had awareness to performance anxiety. And I can't really hear what I'm saying because I'm, you know, that awareness grows and grows. And um, it's what we cultivate here, awareness, right? Thank you. Uh, Wayne, go ahead. It was something a little bit new for me, not particularly with the exercise, but this notion of changing perspective. Yeah. Um, when I've written from uh, 
second and third person perspective in the past, I've assumed that the character that I'm writing about is a different character, <laughs> as opposed to just changing the perspective and having the character of me yeah. be the same. So there's something a little bit unusual there for me. That's I unusual. I just let that unfold. Uh, we don't have to pinpoint and, and analyze it. Just let it unfold in you. It may open up some place that, that is ready to be open. Mm -hmm. Anybody else want to speak up about this? You know what amazes me? In the first prompt that you read um, about the movie theater, you had about 24 hours. Uh, I said, you know, give yourself 10 minutes to write it. Um, and you could go on longer if you wanted, but at least the 10 minutes. Um, but in this case, you had four minutes. I think it was four minutes. Uh, to write this piece and then to turn it around. And what I notice is that the impact, uh, I'm listening to this tapestry, the impact is the same, whether it was written you know, yesterday and you took 20 minutes or in four minutes without any thought, I just flew that, flung that at you uh, and you wrote this. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I'm just so delighted by that miracle that always happens in this group. Again, you know, what we're trying to do here with this method is to illuminate the story of I. Just illuminate it, shine those lights upon it. And we can't really do that if we're lost inside of it. You know, I'm just, just lost in the suffering. I can't see the story. I can't, you know, get any space in there. So if we can light up the stories, um, then we have a chance to loosen our grip on them. The story of I, basically that I'm a separate being, separate from all the rest. I live on a little island inside myself. So that story of I has a chance to be liberated and it can self-liberate. Each one of those stories, yeah, here it comes, here comes a story, there it goes. <laughs> we don't cling. And in selflessness, which is the, uh, what Joel in his book, The Way of Selflessness, what he's talking about here is there being no self for these things to cling to. They arise, they go, no problem. Just like emotions arise, they go. We don't cling to them and we don't dwell upon them. So I'm not asking anyone here to go dwell upon your worst memory and to analyze it and all of, none of that needs to happen in this technique that we're doing. Does that make sense, everybody? Good, good. Just wanna reiterate what we're doing because we can say, oh, let's just have fun with creative writing. And I think we are, this is fun with creative writing. I'm, I'm delighted, but there's a, there's a reason why we're doing it. Um, and that's it, what I just explained. Okay, great. So our time is, is going really well here, timing this out. <clears throat> okay, so I want to read you a poem. This is a very famous poem. I think you've all heard it before. It's written by Mary Oliver, and it's called Wild Geese. I, you think of those stories just flying away on their own, the wild geese. Okay? They're not going to live in your backyard, probably. Depends on where you live, maybe. But they come and go, right? Typically, they don't stay. Okay, so I want to read the poem to you, and then we'll try something together. You do not have to be good. <laughs> I'd like to repeat that line, my friends. Mary Oliver says, you do not have to be good. What a relief, huh? All right, coming back. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscape. Over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers, 
Meanwhile, the wild geese, high in the clean blue air, are heading home again, whoever you are, no matter how lonely. The world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. Mary Oliver's poem, Wild Geese. Now, in the remaining time we have, I'd like to take one line of this poem, and that line is my favorite line. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. And I wanna do a very quick free writing on part of that line. The part I want to give you is you only have to let, and I'm only going to give a minute, I think, on this. We're going to do a rapid fire to end our first session. So the prompt I'm giving you in the spirit of Mary Oliver, you only have to let, and let's begin. Last few seconds. My hope is that the spirit of Mary Oliver does not mind us playing with her poem. What I'd like to do now is read the first few lines to you, and then we'll come to that prompt. You only have to let, and then we'll go around the room again, okay? One after the other. I'm not even going to bow this time. We're just going to blend those voices around and um, and invite Mary Oliver to sit with us and hear what we did in this one minute that I gave you. Okay? So here we go. Um, I will read the first few lines. You do not have to be good, my friends. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let... You only have to let it go, only, only, only. 
the biggest only you have ever experienced. Who attached such a small, simple, innocuous word only to the pain and suffering of a lifetime, of several lifetimes, yours and theirs, so many theirs. You only. No, it is not an only situation. It is the work of that lifetime, of all of their lifetimes, but it is only you who have attempted it. You only have to let life play itself upon you. You only have to allow happening to happen, to be and let being be done. Words disappeared. Let them. You only have to let your love emit, unfold, be bold or sweet. Your true colors be honest, however they come. Do let your deepest of everything be free to express to clear the way for untold presence and wonderment. The whole spectrum is yours to taste and be. You only have to let yourself flow out into the world and discover your love, your talent, your passion, and proceed with arms wide open, embracing your place to be and love. You only have to let yourself be exactly who you are. You were made to be you, not anybody else, with your fears and anxieties, your impish moments, and the still ones too. You thought your true self had one face, the face of stillness and calm and collectedness. But silly you, you never realized that all of them were who you were all along, for better and for worse. You are married to your entire existence exactly as it is. You only have to let the whole universe be as it is. No sweat. It was already that way when you got here. See it, and what do you see? Accept it, and what have you accepted? The whole is one, and so what are you? You only have to allow what is unseparated. You only have to let the colors and shapes emerge before you, creating the beauty. You only have to get out of the way for the glory to appear. You only have to let it all unfold without thinking you know what is right, what is best. You only have to let it go out the window. Let it go. Give it up. I've caught you red-handed, you scoundrel. Did you think we wouldn't know? The jig is up, hand it over. No more room for phonies in this town. I mean it. You're afraid who you'd be without it? Too bad. Seems to me you just don't have a say in it. The authorities have arrived. You're free. Ah, <laughs> I think we did her proud. Mary Oliver, thank you for your lines, Mary Oliver, and let, for letting us play with this um, mm, beautiful, beautiful expressions in one minute or 90 seconds. Um, I, I think that we have um, covered a lot of territory in our first session and um, I am looking forward to the second session of our four episode, a limited series. Who knows, we might end up someplace <laughs> as a limited series. Um, in our next episode, um, we will have another prompt to work on. Um, folks listening in, you're going to get that prompt um, pretty quick here. And the rest of y'all have to look for your email to get the prompt from me. Anybody have a closing comment they want to make or? Anybody have something they need to say? 
Okay, let's let's do yes. Go ahead, Heart Song. I like the intimacy of this group. I mean, mm. it's uh, really nice having this small um, group together, yeah. and so I just want to thank you all. It's just lovely. Thank you, and it's amazing how quickly that intimacy happens with whomever we're given in a mix like this, and how quickly those barriers between our little squares, our Hollywood square boxes we have, or somebody said, uh, what was that other show? Um, the Brady Bunch, was it? Yeah, how quickly that can dissolve. Uh, anybody else want to speak up? Aaron, go ahead. I, this is just beautiful. Uh, you know, it was my first experience with it all, but it's like there's there's a support. There's something moving that feels shared, and it's really a joy to receive and, and then to let it go out. You know, one of my favorite mentors uh, as a guitarist was Mark Knopfler, and he, he used to say creativity is like a sponge. It soaks up all the stuff that you drag it along, and then it spits out something totally unique. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. I sure do. Thank you for that comment. Anybody else want to speak up? Okay, you're going to have another chance uh, when we meet again. Let's do a bow together. And the kind of bow I like to do is very mindful. Um, so I have my hands like this right now, if everybody could kind of follow along. I like to really slow down the bow because, you know, people go like this or over get out of here, right? But we're going to do it slowly, mindfully, um, starting to, you know, just bring the, the palms a little closer, a little slightly, just slightly, slightly. And we can begin to feel the energy between them. And if you look around the screen, look at all these hands. Look at all these hands up here. And slowly they're coming together. <laughs> and you feel that. It's like a ball of energy between them. And then suddenly like one, just the pinkies meet, and the next fingers, and the next fingers, and the thumbs. And then finally the palms together. Everyone's palms together flat. Breathing in, breathing out and then bowing to each other, to the audience, to the seen and the unseen, the spirit of Mary Oliver, reaching up like wild geese, and we can fly on. And I will give us a little bell to accompany us as we go, twice. My teacher, Joel, likes to always end something by saying peace to you all. And I would like to say something else that Joel told me. Go is nothing. See you next time.